crazy, hateful male saying, you infringing on our <laughs> rights. <laughs> but uh, Sister Tartitia is my student in hermeneutics class this past semester and uh, walked through uh, Bible study methods and rules of interpretation. So she is, uh, her class project was to exegete the text we preached on Sunday. Amen. That was her class project. And so we'll be looking at her paperwork Sunday, yeah. And since she had gone through the, the the laborious exercise of doing the text, she's gonna help us teach Bible study tonight. Amen. Amen. So that's gonna be good. Before we get into Bible study, just a couple of reminders. On Fridays, y'all know we have counseling. That's right. And Every week, usually on Thursdays, you'll get two assessments every week. You'll get the quick test and the CBT. Um, we use those. Number one, the quick, the quick test lets us know that everybody's safe and framed in their right mind. Because it measures depression, anxiety, and safety. Uh, the CBT test tells us how well you are not living in your flesh. <laughs> Sister Delray, you caught that because some of us are in our flesh deeply. And as we go through the series, the, the goal is to see you come out of living in your flesh. Now, we're going to give you the material. We're going to be there to walk with you, but you got to do the work. And if you don't do the work, it's going to be apparent. Amen? Yeah. So just a couple of reminders. Some of us have not finished the first round of assessments. And so this is like the second week. You'll have a second CBT coming tomorrow and a second quick test coming tomorrow. So if you haven't finished, we won't even know if last week did you any good. Which means you'll be behind. You don't want to get too far behind. What I found in counseling is generally the help you need is in front of you, but if you don't apply it, you don't get the help you need because you have to do the work. Uh, can God work miracles? But that means you got to pick it up. <laughs> He'll put it right there in front of you. That means, but you've got to pick it up. Amen. So just a couple of reminders about that. Please, please, please stay engaged and stay honest with your assessments and work with your counselors as we try to do what God has called us to do for you. Amen? All right, tonight uh, we dealt with the entire chapter on Sunday of chapter 3, which was a miracle. Um. So it's 29 verses we went through. Normally I would have broke that up into uh, two or three sections, but I did not this time. So we can stay seated because it's a, it's a, it's a long um, passage of scripture to read through. Um, who has an ESV or um, even an NIV tonight? Who? All right. Any version I wrong. Brother Ray Mel, if you would read from verse 1 through 14, and then Sister Tiama, if you pick up and read verses 15 through 29. Which? ESV. What do you have, Brother Ray? NIV? Okay. So you, yeah, you can. Somebody, let's get him some, get some microphones. They're up here on the stage. They're all up here, so. Mm -hmm. I said Spencer. <laughs> Thank you. That's cool breeze. Thank you, Spencer. Yeah. So after those scriptures are read, I'm going to ask First Lady if you would pray for us tonight, and then we're going to get right into it.
Brother Singleton, thank you for loaning us your wife tonight. She's been a great student. All right, so Brother Ramel is going to read verses 1 through 14, and Sister Tiama is going to read verses 15 through 29. Yes. Sister Tiama, stay in the NIV so you, they match it. Mm. All right. You foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? Before your very eyes, Jesus Christ was clearly portrayed as crucified. I would like to learn just one thing from you. Did you receive the spirit by works of the law? or by believing what you heard? Are you so foolish after beginning by meaning, I'm sorry, after beginning by means of the spirit? Are you now trying to finish by means of the flesh? Have you experienced such so much vain? It is really was in vain. So again, I ask, does God give you his spirit, work his miracles among you by works of the law or by believing what you heard? So as Abraham believed God, and it was cre credited to him righteously, understand then that those who have faith are children of Abraham. Scripture foresaw that God would justify Gentiles by faith and announce the gospel in advance to Abraham. All nations will be blessed through you. So those who rely on faith are blessed along with Abraham, the man of faith. For all who rely on works of the law are under a curse, as it is written. Cursed is everyone who does not continue to do everything written in the book of law. Clearly no one who relies on the law is justified before God because the righteous will live by faith. The law is not based on faith. On the contrary, it says the person who does these things will live by them. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who is hung on the pole. He redeemed us in order that the blessings given to Abraham might come to the Gentiles through Christ Jesus, so that by the faith we might receive the promise of the Spirit. This section is entitled, The Law and the Promise. 15, brothers and sisters, let me take an example from everyday life. Just as no one can set aside or add to a human covenant that has been duly established, so it is in this case. The promises were spoken to Abraham and to his seed. Scripture does not say, and to seeds, meaning many people, but, and to your seed, meaning one person, who is Christ. What I mean is this, the law introduced 430 years later does not set aside the covenant previously established by God and thus do away with the promise. For if the inheritance depends on the law, then it no longer depends on the promise. But God in his grace gave it to Abraham through a promise. Why then was the law forgiven at all? It was added because of transgressions until the seed to whom the promise referred had come. The law was given through angels and entrusted to a mediator. A mediator, however, implies more than one party, but God is one. Is the law, therefore, opposed to the promises of God? Absolutely not. For if a law had been given that could impart life, then righteousness would certainly have come by the law. But scripture has look, locked up everything under the control of sin so that what was promised being given through faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. Before the coming of this faith, we were held in custody under the law, locked up until the faith that was to come would be revealed. So the law was our guardian until Christ came that we might be justified by faith. Now that this faith has come, we are no longer under a guardian. So in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith. For all of you who were baptized into Christ 
have clothed yourselves with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, nor is there male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. If you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, we just thank you for allowing us to be gathered here on tonight. Lord, before we pray about Bible study, I want to lift up those who are at home recuperating. We want to pray for Dad Ed, God, that you just continue to bring healing to his body, oh God. We pray for Sister Callie, God, and that you would just touch and heal her body, Lord, in the name of Jesus. Lord, we thank you that you are the God that heals us. And, Lord, as we go into this Bible study, we pray your anointing um, upon Pastor and Sister Torticia, God, as they expound upon your word. Lord, we thank you for the salvation that we have through your name. Be with us on tonight, O oh God. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. Let's get right into it. So we're getting back to, uh, to the book of Galatians, having taken a break from it since... Early December. Yes, sir. Amen. Amen. <laughs> hmm? Yeah. Because of the series in December. November. November. Oh, wow. yeah. yeah. So as we, as we just reflect back, remembering that the book of Galatians, as you see on the slide, is in three sections. You can see three major sections in uh, the book of Galatians. And we're finishing out the second section uh, or we'll be getting into the second section um, as we come back into the book of Galatians. The first one, where Paul gives a defense of the gospel. Um, when many, many theologians uh, look at the book of Galatians as a cleft note version of the book of Romans, and they say that the, the book of Galatians is like the magna cum laude or magna charta of, of our Christian liberty. And you can see how Paul, in just a few words, uh, literally in just six chapters, uh, try to re-educate the Galatians who had somehow allowed uh, false teachers to infiltrate, not just in the church, but in leadership. This is crucial, not just in the church, but in leadership. This is why we have to be very selective who we hear and who we follow. Amen. Amen. And then who we develop and train to stand before us to teach us. Uh, I mean, good intentions are, are, are paved all the way to hell. Yes, sir. Uh, being nice to people is not the same as being right to people. Amen. And so we have to make sure that we're careful with that. And so Paul uh, gives a defense of the gospel because now he's he's ha he's got to come back in and recorrect and reestablish some stuff with the churches of Galatia. It's important to understand this is not just one church. This is the churches in the region of Galatia. Now I say that because it's so important is that so often what affects a church comes by a spirit that has been in other churches. Do you understand what I'm saying? And so a whole region can be infected by wrong teaching. And, and we see this in America with prosperity preaching. It's not just in Georgia. It's not just in Texas. This, this prosperity gospel is in the entire Western Hemisphere. In Africa, and it's only, it seemed like a handful of churches are sticking with the word of God. And many of us could probably testify when we first came to TLC, we felt like the word was just slapping us in the face. Because you had been some places where in your sin you were told you were okay. And how dare this bald head short man come against every way of living I have lived for the last 45 years. My job is to help you get to heaven, not to be comfortable in sin. Yes. 
And if it hits you in the face, I'd rather for you to be hit in the face on earth then stand at the pearly gates and Jesus yells out, depart from me, I don't even know you. Amen. And it seems like the Apostle Paul is, is with force. I mean, you got to think about this. After he had taught them, then he comes back to visit them. He's not coming back nice. <laughs> I don't know about your mom and daddy, but my mom and daddy told you once. I know these newfangled parents, baby girl, they're going to tell the kids 10 times, don't do that, stop this, don't do that, stop that, don't do this. Stop. Sometimes my father's instructions were not verbal, it was just grunts. <clears throat> when you heard, <clears throat> that means now you already know I done told you that was wrong. My mama could throw a curveball with a can around the corner yes. <laughs> and hit you. Yes. Campbell Soup know how to make that knuckleball curve. <laughs> or shoot, Campbell Soup knows how to make that curve. <laughs> they would have been. And so in, in the book of Galatians, I hope you feel the passion that Paul is sharing because Paul's desire is not to make people look bad, it's to make sure they don't end up in a bad place. Amen. And then he talks about the fact that we are free from legalism. And, and the thing about legalism, uh, be careful how you describe legalism. Because legalism is when you do stuff to be saved. Obedience is you do stuff because you are saved. Amen. From, an, from the outside looking in, it looks the same to the unaware. Mm -hmm. But it is, a, it is an internal thing that drives us. Yeah. The reason why I don't lie, cheat, and steal is not to prove to God I earned my right to heaven. I am grateful yeah. that he sent his son yeah. to die for my sin. Yeah. And so freedom from legalism doesn't mean I'm free to do whatever I want to do. And, and, and I think in this day and age, we have seeker-friendly churches that they'll, they'll, they can smell sin all over you. And they're going to come on in, just bring your money, just bring your tithe. You're going to be fine. Just come on in. We love you. We just want you. So, And we have destroyed God's definition of love. We believe in many churches today, love means don't offend anyone. But the real definition of love is don't let anybody be offended in eternity. <laughs> We're going to pet you and stroke you and boy, how wonderful you are. And boy, when you get to the place where de the devil is and you don't recognize Jesus anywhere. No, no, not we. You're in trouble. <laughs> let's, let's, let's make sure. Who you talking about we? <laughs> I'm going to take mine now. So that when I get to heaven, there's no more heartache, no more pain, no more tears. Because where you going to end up, there's going to be gnashing of teeth. You're going to desire to have your, your thirst quenched and not a drop of water going to satisfy you. So let's just make sure we understand. Um, and then, so, so we're finishing up that here in chapter 4, and then we get to chapter 5 and 6. He talks about how we have the freedom to really love and serve each other. T the freedom to love and serve each other is to grab each other by the hand and say, bro, I'm walking with you through this. You're in Christ. Okay, you made some mistakes. Repent. It could be intentional, yeah, you, even if you sinned. Brother, I'm, I'm with you with this. We are in the same family. I'm going to call a spade a spade. You shouldn't have went around that corner, shouldn't have went down to that juke joint. You, that's not judging. 
that is affirming and confirming. You, just because there's no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus, don't live like you are condemned. Mm -hmm. I just really think that's important to stress because you said something that, that really hit me. The scripture says that when we get to heaven, there will be no more crying, no more tears. That means we should expect tears here. So there are going to be times that we are corrected, that we are rebuked. You know what I'm saying? And we need to be so in love with God. That's the thing. When you love God and you're corrected, you're rebuked, you don't fall out, you don't get mad, you don't whine, you don't complain. You know what I'm saying? Because the Holy Spirit of God in you bears witness to this is God loving me so I don't miss heaven. That's right. Amen. But if we're, Jesus said this, if we're looking for our comfort now, then that's what you got. You get comfort now. So don't expect comfort on the other end because in order to get comfort here, you have to be living in your flesh. That's right. That's right. And so this freedom to love and this freedom to serve is I'm not serving because I want you to say well done. I'm doing what I do because I want him to say, well done. Amen. And there are times where you got to be courageous enough to love somebody enough to say, hey, your pants are down. Pull them up, walk with me. To, to, to love and serve like that takes holy boldness. To love like that, I had had, had a, a, a peer of mine who lives in um, somewhere in the Midwest. She runs our food business. And I'm not ashamed of the gospel. And I recognize who I am as a leader. So Easter came and I said, I said to all my staff and all of the leaders in the organization, I said, I hope you and your families enjoy the most historical and important holiday in human history. Happy Easter. So Easter comes and goes. So she comes back. And most people say they're Christian, right? She goes, you know, it didn't hit me how bold you are as a leader until I was sitting in church on Sunday. And my pastor scolded us about not being bold enough about saying happy Easter. She goes, 6,000 employees, and you say the most significant day in human history. She goes, that's boldness. God didn't call us to be approved by men. He called us to be bold before them and proclaim his name. And I'm not saying you got to Bible thump people, but when opportunities like that, all I'm taking Good Friday off. And they're going to have the Easter bunny with the Easter eggs and they got all this stuff. So I'm going to take advantage of what you're getting ready to do. Same thing when it comes to Christmas. Amen. I didn't invite you to my holiday. <laughs> we got old. You, you celebrate it with me, so let me just give you perspective. Amen. 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 And, and so we have to be bold. And it takes boldness to really love and serve people the way God wants them loved on and served. When we look at, and I'm going to deal with this next week, when we talk about chapter 4, one of the things that God, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son to die for the world. Now, that wasn't nice. If Jesus was one of our ragamuffins, and we announced to, G, we, we announced to one of our ragamuffins, I'm sending you down the street to die. We throwing a tantrum. We saying to God, you unfair. Why are you treat me like this? I deserve better. Why are you taking all of this luxury that I have up in here and you just throwing it away? Our ragamuffins, including us, will throw a tantrum. But he that knew no sin. 
joined us in our mess. Right? That's boldness. It takes boldness to really love and serve. And our definition of love in this world is skewed. It's skewed. It's like we lust for people. We don't love them. Churches are filled with pastors who want people to tell, good message, good message, wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. But if he preach something that's scolding and come down their street and tell them to stop sinning, we got we to vote him out. Right. Oh, Lord. Well, can't, no, if, if this is going to be like this every Sunday, I'm, I ain't coming. We vote with our feet. We go somewhere else. Okay. I'm going I'm to go, I'm going to go, where you going to tell me I'm good? Well, I want to go to church every Sunday for somebody to tell me what's wrong with me. I'm trying to get you to heaven, not to hell. Amen. Amen. Can I say it like this? The fruit of your life, while your mouth might say you belong to the kingdom, the fruit of your life tells me you're going to hell. The devil can profess Satan. Does that change his destination? The devil can say, I know Jesus. I saw Jesus. I know what his throne looked like. I know the pearly gates. I know the streets paved with gold. I was there. That does not change his destination. So you ain't said nothing if your lips don't line up with your life. And so, you know, when, you, when you're in a place that's going to challenge what your lips say, because, listen, I wouldn't come at you if you didn't say you were saved. Right. I need to understand. My job is to make disciples. That means you are saved. And I'm going by what you say. And so if your lips tell me one thing and your life shows something different, I'm supposed to come at you. Somebody say, oops. oops. That's why Pastor's been preaching like that. Amen. <laughs> Get your knee a sporum. <laughs> I only. Fall for that, Tiffany. Tiffany being the best. We'll Hey Tyrone, I got some for too. <laughs> I'm glad we could laugh about it. <laughs> but this is what the contents of of Galatians is is all about as we catch each other up. So Sunday when we looked at the entire chapter, chapter 29, when you start looking at it, you see about five arguments that Paul uh, proposes to the Galatians as to why they're justified by faith alone, and it makes no sense to go back and try to practice legalism. And so that's what we worked on was those five arguments. And I, I tried to give them as five reminders because I'm at a point now we ain't arguing. <laughs> I just want to remind you. <laughs> if you got if you got to fuss about it, go talk to God. Matter of fact, stay on your knees till you get the answer you're looking for. <laughs> or you come into agreement with what God said, Amen. right? So I try to give it as reminders with the, with the opportunity or the desire to, to encourage those of us who say we're in Christ that our salvation is secure. It's secure because our Savior died for us. Amen. Not for any reason of our own. Our Savior died for us, and we put all everything we can in terms of our faith and trust in him. Amen? Amen. And so that was really the reason for the message on Sunday. So a couple of, the, of, of questions, and, and these, are, these are just teasers. How did you become a believer? Hmm? God called you. How did you become a believer? Did I hear somebody say they don't know? Oh, that, 
Okay. <laughs> I was just I was just messing. I was just messing. I made, but how did you become a believer? Now, for my young people back there, y'all might want to help them out. But if you don't know how you became a believer, you may not have become a believer. Some lost person, God's going to set up an appointment for you to talk to. And they're going to ask you, how do I get saved? Anybody hear crickets? Discussion question. It's open for. <laughs> Just in case you were wondering. I, I wasn't looking for any silence. I, have a... I, I heard your answer. It asks, how did you become a believer? You have to believe to, by definition, be a believer. You have to believe. Anybody else? I want you to expound on that word believe because you believe fire would burn you, right? Yes. So, so expound on that. It's probably going to make you go do a Greek word definition of the word belief in this context. But how do you become a believer? Believe in what? Jesus. That he literally died. You, you believe he died. Yes. Yes. See, we don't, we don't put it all together. I, I, I believe in Jesus. Well, most people do. The devil. Did he die for you personally? Do you believe he paid your sin debt? Yes. I, I, I got yes. No, this is where we're going to get messed up. Do you believe he is the Lord of your life? Yes. yes. Okay, how come you haven't stopped some of the sinning you're doing? I just dropped the mic right See, that's where you got to be careful. I knew pastor was coming for you. I knew he was coming for you. Everybody will admit he was born. Yes, Lord. Everybody will admit he died. Yes. Everybody will admit he rose again. Yes. But how many will actually say he is Lord? Yes. Husbands and wives, Friday will be a whole lot easier if you actually believe that because as a husband and wife these role competitions we got going on this disobedience we got going on with to friday christly would be a whole lot easier for us i'm telling you we have some nominal christians that's, that's why we got to stop being so having so much air in our chest about being saved we have to really humble ourselves and look at the word of God and really ask myself, am I living according to what this book says? Not what I have decided to twist and turn and mangle and manipulate and all the other kind of stuff. Because when I stand before God, he's not going to judge me based upon my feelings and my opinions. But he's going to judge me based upon what he wrote. And the majority of us don't even know what he wrote so how can you say you know when you don't even know what he wrote because there's not even a burden to study the word of god and that's what scares me because we yes amen i know i love jesus and jesus is like but i don't even know you and i, I want to push you guys because i'm not after anybody who's going to hell I'm after whoever say they want to go to heaven. Amen. So if you get personal, maybe you want to go to hell. Mm. I'm after the ones who say they want to go to heaven. Amen. Is he Lord? Does his book call shots in your life? In every area of your life. And listen to me, there's some areas that are tough. Because of what we've been through in our childhood and early adulthood and all this other stuff. But in spite of that, does your flesh drive you? It's going to get easy Friday. Mm. 
So just to piggyback on what Laetar and Pastor said, when we were going through pride, we talked about Satan's attributes and what happened that caused him to fall. And so if we are taking on the same characteristics as Satan, then we'll have the same fall. Listen, if you take a tomato seed and put it in good soil, what is it going to produce? Tomatoes. Mm -hmm. If you take a banana seed and put it in good soil, what is it going to produce? If you take the devil's seed and cultivate it in your heart, what are you producing? You are not producing anything that looked like Jesus. Whatever is being cultivated in your heart, that's the kingdom that you live in. And that's the kingdom that you belong to. And sometimes when words like this go forward, the demon-possessed people do this. And they might, I hear what you're saying, but I ain't listening. Because I know where I'm going. No, baby, your seed is telling us where you're going. Are you with me? It's important we understand this because the problem with the Galatians, they went back to practice legalism instead of following the one who saved them if they got saved. Boy, this is, this is good to me if it ain't good to nobody else. Paul spent time talking to them not to challenge their salvation, but to prove to them what kingdom they belong to. Trust me, some funerals took place from some, for, for some Galatians back then. They went to hell. They heard Paul, and they went to hell. It's important for us when we talk about belief, you got to believe in the life, the burial, the resurrection, the coming again. And then you have to make sure he is Lord. You've not said anything recalling anything that's historical. <laughs> Death, burial, resurrection, that's all historical. I can give you a history test. Put three questions on there. Did Jesus die? Yes. Did Jesus, was he buried? Yes. Did Jesus rise again? Yes. Here's the question. Is he your Lord? And the answer generally is not given by your mouth. It is given by your life. Are you with me? Uh, We're going to push hard because it, this is important. Paul, uh, how do you become a Christian? Well, the question is, when do you become a Christian? It's simple. When you accept the Lord Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior and you make him Lord. 24 by 7. 365 on normal years, and you don't get a break on leap year. He's Lord. Yes, sir. Hit in the mic just so we can hear you. I'll say, well, you think that we as Minnesota Gospel has to do a better job for us uh, when people come to the, you know, get come themselves on, to the, uh, Christ because a lot of times they just come up and say, oh, I believe in Jesus and say a prayer, but I don't really understand what it entails, you know, for us, like you're breaking it down, for us, repentance, repentance, which change the heart, yeah. you know, direction, like, you know, really submitting and denying yourself. Yeah, you time. know, and, and you're right. We have to do a better job. Because when people go to hell on our watch, we got to be able to answer the question, was it because we were sloppy handling the word of God? How can they hear without a... And if... Go ahead. And if preachers are not doing a good job 
so that those that can hear. And hearing is not for the itching of ears. When you preach an evangelistic message, it ought to be for total conviction of a lost soul. They need to walk out of here knowing if a truck ran over them as soon as they got into the parking lot, hell is where they're going. They need to realize if that door fell off the hinges and cracked them upside the head, hell is where they're going. They need to know if the lights were to fall out of the ceiling in the sanctuary, a safe place where we're supposed to worship God, but a thunderstorm or an earthquake comes and the building collapses, even in a safe place and they're killed, they need to know they're going to hell. But we, we preach these evangelistic messages, oh, just come down, just give the Lord your hand, and repeat this simple prayer after me, Lord, I've transgressed against your word, and I'm so sorry I broke your heart. God, if you would just lead me and guide me for the rest of my days, I promise that I will be a good kingdom citizen. Not whether or not I am broken over my sin. Not whether or not I'm going to make you Lord of my life. That you're going to lead me, guide me. You're going to be the decision maker in everything. that We don't give those kind of messages. And when we stand before God, that blood is on our hands. You're right. We have to do a better job. But we don't got so comfortable in making people like us. I'm supposed to make you love Jesus. And if that means you hate me in the process of you loving Jesus, I've done my job if you lost. If your destination ends up in heaven, I've done my job. You know, I'm always putting the plug in for Sunday school. This is why Jesus was upset with the disciples. Because when they brought the epileptic man, I mean, boy, to the disciples, they were supposed to be able to help him, and they were not. And this is going back to what Brother Donnie was saying. This is why we got to be slow to say yes, because we don't have the power to help anybody. We don't even know, honestly, truly, if Pastor were to pass around a piece of paper and ask us to write down which scripture, why we know we're saved, we will be stuck in the face. And that's just the truth. And we've got to move past this sloppy, using all these words, but there's no real commitment, dedication, nothing to Jesus Christ being our Lord. I know when we were going through the Set Free series, one of the things I challenge you to think about is don't impress me when you come to church looking nice. Can Jesus move into the spare bedroom in your house? You ain't said nothing. You ain't said nothing because you said, good morning, Pastor. Right. Pastor, you want a donut? I do. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I don't. But you, you ain't said nothing. <laughs> if, you, if, if Jesus can't move into the guest bedroom in your house, can he, can he come into your master bedroom Amen. and hear your conversations? Right. Can he sit at your dinner table and listen in at your arguments? Can he go into your bathroom and see what you do all by yourself when nobody else ain't there with you? You ain't said nothing to me by being nice to me. Can Jesus move in? Can Jesus wear your clothes? Can Jesus pimp your ride and ride with you? Could he listen to your radio stations? Your TV shows? Can he, can he follow you on YouTube and look at the YouTube shorts you tune into? Could he read your spam? Y'all didn't hear that. Because spam tells you where you've been. No, we, we could delete the internet history. But what we can delete is some cookies that start populating our spam box because of where we've been. Can he... Can, can Jesus do an audit? How, how, many, how many folk is accountants? When you got to trace down to every nickel, every penny, can he do an audit of your life and come back and you pass? Here's the thing, here's the thing. Some of us don't have enough journal entries. 
I done messed up somebody. Because here's a journal entry. When you mess up, did you go and ask him to forgive you? Or you just ignored it because you got away with it? So your ledger is full of stuff. <laughs> All right, we're going to leave the donuts alone tonight. But that's, that's the totality of salvation, and sometimes we get this watered-down version of salvation. Oh, touch and agree. Put your hand to the screen. Or you're at the altar crying, and we assume you're getting a breakthrough. No, you're crying because you got caught. Your feelings are hurt. Right. No deliverance. Your feelings are hurt. I'm struggling in this situation, and God, I want you to help me. He says, I plan to after you make me Lord. Amen. But I'm going to use this situation to drive you to me. I found in my life, Ron, there is no relief of pressure, at least from God, until I release and put everything in his hands. Amen. But if you're going to come pray and get up and go back and do the same thing you did yesterday, that's not repentance at all. Amen. If, if I'd have made somebody mad... <laughs> Why'd you come? <laughs> somebody, somebody got their hand up. No, I was just going back to what Lady Tara was saying. You're right. Pastors have, and preachers of the gospel, they have, an obligation, but it still comes back to us. Oh, it's always because, on you. You're yeah, going to hell on your own. It's always going to come back to us <laughs> because the truth of the matter is you're not going to, real, realistically, when you think about when you're being taught the word, and if you are really studying the word, you're going to see that what's in the word is being taught to you. So why are you being offended? That's right. Now, you know, we now play the you blame game. Hurt. We play the blame game, but one of the fleshly things we're going to talk about as we go through the counseling is blaming. Right. You can play the, the blame game all you want to. Right. Hell is where you're going. Yeah. <laughs> because you, you're going to, you're, I mean, we get what I call the gut punch. You know, you're going you're gonna to get the gut punch. It's going to come to you because if the word is coming to you, and you're receiving it like you should be. You go. You should be getting a gut punch a time or two. Once or twice. Right. But at that point in time, what I'm, when I'm, what I was connecting to what Lady Tar was saying, is that if you're not receiving that, then you're not gonna. You're gonna believe you're okay because, like she said, your chest is puffed up, and it does not gonna bring you to repentance either. Right. I've learned this. I'm, I'm, I, I got to go on, I know, because I got a whole lot to cover tonight. But I've learned this. Sometimes I come in and I'm ready to preach, and it's like it's going to be a simple message. And then God says, uh-uh, not based on who's here. Jesus. <laughs> oh, Jesus. Oh. <laughs> he, he reaches down, he turns the volume up, and he amps it up just a little bit. He goes, uh-uh, uh-uh, not, 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 not based on who here. Not based on the attitude just came through that door. No, no, not what they did last week, uh-uh. I know, I know what you think you coming to do. It's gonna be a simple message. I'm gonna be low key, and I'm gonna be, you know, just cool, calm, and collect. Ain't gonna raise my voice at all. I'm not gonna walk down no aisle. I'm not gonna do any of that. And then, and then the Lord say, based on who come through them door, no, you're gonna do exactly what I'm getting ready to make you do. And I've learned to just say, yes, Lord. <laughs> so, so here's the second question what's the futility of all false religions and by the way believing your own stuff don't stink is a false religion what's the futility of all false religions that's right it's never enough they all get you to the same place hell <laughs> they all get you to where their leader is 
dead and in hell. And so real quickly, they're cursed. They're cursed from where they are. So now, what we find in, in chapter 3 is that Paul had these five arguments that we're going to talk about that demonstrate the sufficiency of justification by faith alone. He starts off, there's five sections in chapter 3. The first section, he addresses the Galatians in verses 1 through 5. And many theologians say when he addresses the Galatians, it's also for all Gentile believers. Matter of fact, it's for all believers in Christ Jesus. The second piece, um, he, he makes the argument concerning Abraham. And he pulls in some historical facts like, you know, Abraham is considered righteous, right? Everybody would say, uh-huh. Did you know Abraham did not know the Ten Commandments, right? Uh-huh. Well, how is he righteous? It was outside of the law. Matter of fact, it was hundreds of years before the law came, right? Uh-huh. Paul is giving these arguments knowing if you actually know the truth, you'll go like, uh-huh. He's leading the witness. And then the third argument was the argument of the law. Paul says, do you recall any time a person was considered righteous based on what they did by the law? The answer would be no, except, except one. That man named Jesus, he committed no sin. And then he talks about what Jesus did conquering sin for us by hanging on a cross, dying, buried in a tomb, and then he's r resurrected from the dead. And in the meantime, while he was dead, he was still working. Because he went down into hell and set captives free. The place of Hades where Abraham Moses, where they all, David, where they all lived is forever empty from that day forward. It's no longer a, a container for righteous people waiting for the fullness of time. The fullness of time was Jesus Christ coming. That place is now forever empty. So don't think if you are Catholic, purgatory is going to hold on to you for a while. It's done. Nobody's praying you out of there. And the Savior has already come and emptied the room. And then he talks about the Spirit of God. What does the Spirit of God do? I mean, for saved people, when you do wrong, is there anything that tells you you shouldn't have done that? Some of us are so selfish, though, I don't think we hear anything. This is why I'm telling you, the way some of us live, you place in doubt in my mind. Because the Spirit of God in you wouldn't cause you to have to come talk to me all the time. <laughs> the Spirit of God in you would say, whoa, 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 whoa. Stop wasting that man time. You know this wrong. You know this. You know, say it again, Pastor. You know this behavior is not becoming of a saint. You know this behavior don't tell Jesus, thank you, I'm grateful. And, and some of us, some of us, sisters, sister, sister Ebony, we test a lie on the Holy Ghost. Holy Ghost ain't no way in their heart. And we test a lie. The Lord showed me. No, no, no. If the Lord showed you that about them and didn't show you nothing about yourself, that's a different spirit. That's a different spirit. Because what I learned is the Holy Ghost sweep around your front door first. Y'all ain't hearing me. He take the dustpan and the broom to your front door first. Oh, he coming in there. You find yourself in your closet, you didn't even know what's still packed in there. Amen. <laughs> oh, it's real. 
if the Holy Ghost is, is really showing you all these prophetic dreams about everybody else, <laughs> and you living raggedly, So how are we going to do it now? I'm going to give you some points. Sister Tortisha is going to talk about the word studies as they come. How's that? First lady going to jump in wherever she fit in and she's going to have fun. Always. Hey, 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 hey. So the first point we made came from the first five verses. If you read them, you'll see that Paul is dealing with the Galatians. He's talking about what happened to you when you say you got saved. All right, let me just pause like this. When sometimes when people come to you with some stuff, and you ought to look at them like, what happened to you when you got saved? Mm, that's good. We always say common sense will tell you not to do stuff. No, sense ain't that common. So stop saying that. But if you save, you, you mean tell me the Holy Ghost didn't stop you? No, you said you were saved. Do, do you know any of the Ten Commandments? Why are you still practicing them? Why are you still breaking all of them? Well, we're not under the law anymore. Well, let me just remind you. Jesus says you love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, and soul, and your neighbor and yourself. You've satisfied all of the law. So holy folk, not that we live according to the law, but we don't practice law breaking because we love God, first five commandments, and we love our neighbor, the second five. Are you with me? And so Paul, Paul reminded them, he said, listen, don't you remember when you got saved? What saved you? D do y'all see the question here and the reason why I asked the first discussion question? Because some of us are stuck like Chuck. We can't give an answer like some of those Galatians couldn't give. And Paul was saying, well, maybe you didn't get saved. Because if you did, you ought to know the answer. Paul said, I preached the gospel to you. It brought you to a place of conviction, and you turned to the gospel because the law provided no relief. The second thing is, if you come to Christ and he takes up residence in your heart, you can't turn away from him. Amen. Amen. Now let me talk to some folk who done got so prideful and stubborn in their heart and they might just be saved and nobody knows but God. He has the right to punch your clock out early because he will not let you live on earth bringing shame to his name. Be careful. Be ca tell your neighbor, be careful. Claiming to be saved and acting like an unsaved person. God has the right to make a car wreck, turning out of the church parking lot, take you home. You know, acting like an unsaved person, that doesn't mean just drinking and smoking and fornicating. That's right. Right? When you look at Galatians chapter 5, when you look at the fruit of the Spirit, and your life does not match any of that fruit, because, you know, black folk like to put an S on stuff. But the Bible says fruit. <laughs> and so if you are saved, you have the Holy Spirit. And if you have the Holy Spirit, you have the fruit. So when you look at your life and all you see is flesh and not spirit, Paul said in Romans 8 and 9, then you're none of God's because only saved people have the spirit of God. That was a commercial for chapter 5. <laughs> I'm telling you, when we get to chapter 5, it's going to go through each fruit. <laughs> we could spend like six months on chapter 5. You, you know what I know right now. We already spent that much time on the, on the armor. On, 
<laughs> we gonna make it through one day. <laughs> like I said, I want to be thorough. So you, when you get up at the wrong resurrection, and the Lord says, do you remember when he went through putting on the whole armor of God? How long was it to aggravate you? Mm-hmm. You got that in your mind. You know how long he went through the fruits of the flesh? Mm-hmm. That, that, do you know how long he went through the fruits of the spirit? Mm -hmm. So now you know. Depart from me, you worker of iniquity. I don't even know you. It's 8 o'clock. Yeah. <laughs> I had to put a timer on to make sure <laughs> I had to make sure I was at a certain place. I needed to be at point number one. Because I knew I was running tight. <laughs> the second point. Remember what the Bible says. When did the law make Abraham righteous? It's like Paul asking these leading questions. Because, hmm? you know, y'all big on Abraham. When did, it make, when, when did the law make Abraham? Well, um. You know, some some scholar who who knows all of the history. Uh, Paul, I think you made a mistake. The law wasn't here when Abraham. Paul said, I know that. So it never made him righteous. What made Abraham righteous? Long before Romans was written, the Old Testament in Habakkuk chapter 2, I believe, says the just shall live by his faith. What did God say to Abraham, I believe, in the book of Genesis? His faith was counted for righteousness. Faith in what? Faith in what God had told him. Abraham put everything in God's care. God, wherever you tell me to go, that's where I'm going to go. God, however you lead me, that's how you're going to lead me. God, if you tell me to leave my family behind, worshiping all those idols and false God, then God, that's what I'm going to do. You said look out and look at the land and pick which side I want. God, whatever side you want me to have. We, we trying to hobnob with the rich and famous. We got a name drop with somebody who's got some clout. We ain't mentioned Jesus not once. You know what makes it so bad, Pastor, is the Galatians were Gentiles. So the Galatians had heard the gospel through Paul. They had received the gospel, and then they had let Jews come in and tell them that they also had to follow these laws. So they didn't even realize to what extent following these laws was going to put them into bondage. Man. And that's why Paul was so upset. That's right. So also, he talked about how they saw Jesus with their own eyes. So some of them were even, or maybe all of them at that time, were witnesses of Jesus, his oh, yeah. life, his death, burial, resurrection, maybe even the ascension. So they saw it, and then Paul explained it. Yeah. That's even more condemning. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so they should have known. They should have. Why did they forget Y'all from Missouri, the show me state. <laughs> Missouri in the house. Word study, verse 15. Read the scripture. Okay. Brethren, I speak in the manner of men, though it is only a man's covenant, yet if it is confirmed, no one annuls or adds to it. Um, my, my version is the New King James. Apologize. So, um, with confirmed, um, <laughs> confirmed uh, to make valid, to confirm publicly or solemnly, to ratify or to be ratified, uh, to be or become formally approved and invested with legal authority. And my version says a nose, but um, King James says, uh, disannulleth, 
So it's to do away with, to set aside or disregard, or to invalidate. So, so what Paul was saying here, he said the covenant that, that was made was not from men. And if it was going to be confirmed, if God confirmed this covenant, there was nothing else that was coming along to unconfirm it, so to speak. Or to say, all right, this is no longer, the law has come, he's done away with all the covenants. Um, no. Now, the next point we made was from verses 15 through 18, when, when Paul now begins to deal with the promise. Remember who made the promise? God. Who? God. A committee? Yes, sir. What I feel? No. Well, to me? We get a lot of to me theology. Mm. We get a lot of I feel theology. While you may have valid feelings and you are fully equipped to philosophize and think, God never solicited your input. And it's not to be nasty or mean. God made this promise, not you. Amen. And your situation doesn't change his promise because of what you've been through, or how you feel. You know, I just need validation sometimes. I just need to be affirmed. No, just have faith in Jesus Christ. In the end, all of that's going to work out. We get too short-sighted thinking about what's going to happen between now and 70-plus years instead of playing the long game, what's going to happen for eternity. Amen. You pick which side you want to concentrate on. I'm playing the long game. Because I'm going to spend a whole lot more time on that side of glory. I ought to start asking people this question. I used to ask, if it doesn't bother you in five years, it shouldn't matter. If it doesn't bother you in this life, if it doesn't matter in eternity, this lifetime don't even matter. Amen. Just get through it. Because if you can just get through this life in Christ, you're going to forget this life in Christ. You, you're going to get to heaven and, and it will be no, I wish I could go back to earth and do this all up. No, no, no. So we're talking about Abraham, right? He made the promise to Abraham. Yes, sir. Yes, so ma'am. So with Abraham, he had to go through a lot, a lot of like what we go through. He's telling us to leave behind the idols, leave behind the family that worship the idols. He's us leave to behind see. the family. Leave behind the family. We, you, you tell me I got to leave my family. Oh, I'm not going to leave my family. Right. So he was in it for the long game. So he passed it on to his son, Isaac. And then he was told to sacrifice his son. So how many of us are willing to sacrifice something near and dear to our heart if God said to let it go? Ooh, ooh. You hitting us in the face. So it's just examples that God put Abraham through to show that he was focused on what God said and not on the current situation. Even the promise of Isaac. Yeah. I mean, and you, you said it so well, is that Abraham was looking at the long game. Because there's something in the Bible where he says, I'm going to make you father of many nations. I'm glad he was talking to Abraham because some of us wouldn't be thinking past our own children. Right. Right. Some of us won't even be thinking about our own mom and daddy looking at, you mean every nation based on the decision I'm making right now, every nation after me will have access to this promise. God, I tell you what, catch me later. I got something else to do. That's what some of us would do. Let me think about it. God, you asked me to give up too much. Hmm? Oh, he, well, he had his old stuff. He, he was wealthy.
faith is key to having a full experience. I'm not going to give you some of the words of my faith. I'm going to put something that matters to you. I'm glad it was Abraham. Because yeah. I can tell you about the life of some people. We would, we would stick with what we know right. than what, we, what God has for us. We will stick with, I, I, before I let it go, give it to me. Give it to me. Give it to me first. Give it to me first, and then we can move from here. God, we want to negotiate with God. Because yeah, when God told Abraham to leave, he said, I'm going to bless you, right? The Bible doesn't tell us at that point they knew that Sarah was barren. You know, so we got to make sure that we're not adding to the text. And then, and then at the point that Ishmael came along, you know what I'm saying? He was happy with Ishmael. And it was God who had to tell him to let that go because Ishmael wasn't the promise. So back to, to your point, sis, a lot of times... We are not at that point that no matter what it is, we Abraham's, will let it go and obey God. Abraham's wife was named Sarah. Abraham was happy with Sarah that he gave him some play. Mm-hmm. But the Bible doesn't say that, sis. The Bible doesn't. So you got to be careful Abraham's wife allowed him to sleep around. We gotta look at the reality of this thing. <laughs> he did not argue the point. No, he did not. No, Sarah. I am faithful to you, Sarah. I rebuke you. He was like, let's do this. Right. Uh, yeah. he at nine is fun. And then she had a baby. <laughs> and Abraham was happy with Ishmael. He was. God had to tell him no. no. Yeah. God had to remind him that's not what I promised you. <laughs> Y'all wouldn't have made this promise happen. That's not what I promised you. How many times are we going to make God's stuff will happen? To this day, the whole world is suffering because Abraham listened to his wife. Remember who made the promise? God. It was a permanent promise. Mm-hmm. It was a promise to Abraham mm-hmm. and his descendants. Yeah. The promise came before the law was ever given. The promise is never going to be revoked by the law. The promise was based on God's mercy, not Abraham's performance. And certainly not our performance. Now that right there, for me to say Father Abraham had many sons, Father Abraham, and I'm one of them, and so are you, I got reason to praise God. Hmm? All right, verse 19. What purpose then does the law serve? It was added because of transgressions to the seed should come to whom the promise was made, and it was appointed through angels by hand of a mediator. Of a mediator is one who intervenes between two, either in order to make or restore peace and friendship or form a compact or for ratifying a covenant. Mm-hmm. A mediator is a noun, a negotiator who acts as a link between parties, sometimes specifically selected. Who is the mediator? God. His son, Jesus. Who is God? God took upon himself to be his self appointed mediator. And the word of God tells us that Jesus was crucified before the foundations of the world was formed. So God had already decided 
that Jesus was going to be a mediator before he even gave the promise to Abraham, before he even gave the law to men. He had already decided how this thing's going to work out. I'm so glad God didn't wait till I mess up. <laughs> he knew I would, and he made a plan in advance. <laughs> Come on. Every day you show up, you got to bring something to die. And then my job will be told so nasty, I got to put on an apron, drain the blood, and sprinkle it on the mercy seat. Throw some stuff on a fire and let it burn. And there's stuff that's going to burn on that altar that is not edible because it's part of the waste system. Mm. Folk don't like to come to church anyway. <laughs> right. You, can you imagine if that's how you had to come to church? You ain't riding in your nice Lincoln. You, you, you got a horse wagon in the back because you dragging along that lamb. You, you're not living in a, in a high-rise apartment or uh, on the golf course down there at Appalachia Farms. You're living on a farm farm. And when it comes Passover, you got to take one of them lamps and set it aside and purge it before you bring it. If you ain't happy Jesus came, I am. Me and Minister Singleton will be, and the rest of the folk that have been called into ministry will be serving at the church. One of us go into the Holy of Holies, and if we ain't holy that day, we drop dead in there, and they got to pull us out by a rope. Um, I done made too many mistakes, mistakes even after accepting my call in ministry. Right, we are we are doing paper scissors. It's your turn. It's your turn. <laughs> I'm sorry. The lot has been drawn for Ray Mel. That's how they did it. They cast, they cast lots. lots. Do that dice, that Ray Mel. We I don't know how they did it, but your name right there. Right. Your turn. <laughs> That's right. Why you got to use yours? I got mine. <laughs> Things will be totally, totally, totally different. One argument with First Lady the morning of, and then I got to go into the Holy of Holy. Mm. Lord, 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 please. Can can a rainstorm come? <laughs> can something happen this morning so we can get through this? And I live. <laughs> well, if you think about it, Pastor, this is really serious because before they could even go in there, they had to wash and sacrifice Man. and the blood. And so after all of that, you know, following the the law and the commandments and the rules, and you get in there and you still drop down dead, you was messed up. You was messed up. You was messed up. Point number four, remember what Christ did for us. He's the only one died that satisfied God's anger for my sin. He did what the law could not do. He redeemed us from the curse of the law. If anybody should be hanging on that Roman cross, it should have been every one of us. But he hung up there in our place. And here is the truth of the matter. God is no longer angry with sin. Now, you could be lost as a jaybird. He's not lost with your sin. He's angry angry because you didn't accept his son what a different reason to go to hell for 
you went to hell because you never acknowledged Jesus as Lord? Oh, you know you sin. You know you deserve hell. And since you, re you rejected Jesus, you going there. Somebody said with gasoline clothes on. There you go. Fix it up. I had to fix it. <laughs> and then like one more. This is good one right here. That's right. Okay. Verse 24, therefore the law was our tutor to bring us to Christ that we might be justified by faith. Um, and that's schoolmaster for the KJV. A tutor or a guardian and a guide of boys. Among the Greeks and the Romans, the name was applied to trustworthy slaves who were charged with the duty of supervising the life and morals of boys belonging to the better class. The boys were not allowed so much as a step out of the house without them before arriving at the age of manhood. So this was a moral caretaker, a person appointed to watch over a young child, train his public behavior, and keep him safe in public, perhaps with the fuller understanding of a tutor. The law was our schoolmaster, our tutor, to teach us how to act with manners in public. The law could not do anything to your heart but teach you how to act when you leave the house. Mm. So in Genesis, we find um, Noah. I'm not sure what chapter, but by the time we get to the days of Noah, it talked about how lawlessness ruled in the earth. So even after Noah, <laughs> it began, it continued. All over. It just continued. But he saw that they were righteous and kept them. But because of sin, we still needed the law. Yeah. And the law is tormenting, to be honest with mm -hmm. you. The law is a tormentor. Like, I had a teacher. I'm, 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 nothing about my brain likes math. I got A's in all my other classes, but when it came to math, I struggled, struggled, struggled. So, <sighs> Algebra 2, I did good in Algebra 1, but once I got to Algebra 2, I couldn't do it. And Mr. Matsumoto's, his um, way of teaching was, I'm going to explain this to you one time. And if you can't get it, then you shouldn't be in my class. That that's how he was. He wasn't a good tutor. And and that's how this that's how the law is. Like this is what it is. There's no grace. There's no mercy. There's no help. There's no encouragement. There's no way out. It just is what it is. And if you don't do it, you're condemned. Mm. And so, and that's what Paul was saying to the Galatians. Why would you go back to something that all it's doing is condemning you? Yeah. Unfortunately, sometimes we like rules better than the gospel mm -hmm. because then it makes us feel good. I could just check it off and then I'm good to go. Yeah, they can check it off, but they don't really understand. How many of you has ever gone to uh, an attorney's office and saw all of the law books? Listen to what the text says. The law was the tutor for young boys so to govern how they behave in public, and they couldn't leave home without it. Now imagine toting on your back all them books wherever you go, and whatever you do, you got to search through the book to see if you broke one. And that's the reason why you got to bring a lamb, a bullock, or a dove the next time you show up at the temple. Because you did mess up. You most definitely messed up. Every time. And you got to know why. So how burdensome, how, how laden down you would be because the law is always looking over you, watching your every move. Wrong, 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 
wrong, wrong. And you don't got to be friends with that lamb that you don't gave a name. It's lamb chops. It's lamb chops for the priest. <laughs> Not for you. <laughs> and then the last point we had uh, was remember what the Holy Spirit is doing in us. Remember what, it's, what it is doing in us. Not only did it free us from the law, sometimes we got to be reminded we're free. Because as First Lady said, we so easily go back to the checklist. Well, at least I didn't do this. At least I didn't do that. At least I didn't do this. At least I wasn't so bad. At least I didn't do what they did. At least I didn't stay as long as she stayed. We forget how quickly we go back to the standard of the law. Instead of saying, did it glorify God? Yes, sir. The people that actually saw the life, the death, the resurrection, in your mind, what what would make them go back to the law? And you actually, and most people are visual creatures as humans. We saw this happen. What would make us <coughs> renounce? We saw it happen to go back to that law. Yeah, so just be reminded what Paul says here is that they allowed themselves to be led and taught by people who were not of God. This is why it's so important that becoming a disciple rests in your hands. That you study the word as it's being taught to make sure it is the word. What happens is we get lazy. And when you get lazy, your flesh can be easily tickled. Ooh, that sounds good. How many of us was mesmerized back in the days of hoopology when the preacher climbed the mountain and then he started to hoop? That's all I knew. <laughs> For many of us, many of us were told you ain't preached you ain't if you didn't hoop. Right. Yeah. But can I be honest? How many of us was actually sleeping until the, the preacher, <clears throat> until he crunk up? And then we said that was good preaching. Yep. <laughs> when, we, when, when we as the people of God get lazy and we don't become students of the word of God, it's not who fooled us. We let down. We got lazy. Yes, ma'am. This is the pastor's last side slide. But I also think it's easy for us to go back because our faith is really not where we think it is. That's right. And so when you think about the Galatians being Gentiles, it probably was easy for them to go back to rules because that's where they had started. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? And so that's why we, it's just the teacher in me. We got to know what this Bible says. That's right. You know, because when we don't know what the Bible says, it's easy for us to jump on bandwagons and to be believing stuff that we think God said because somebody that we think is anointed said it when, in fact, the Bible didn't say that. And so now we're following stuff that's not in Scripture. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's so easy. So when we were learning a few months ago in Colossians, we learned about how depraved we were. So even after all the miracles that people might have seen, even after the death, burial, and resurrection, that was a miracle. We talked about it on Good Friday, the miracles. The mind is so depraved. I, I just want to go back to my slop. That's good. I want to go back to my vomit because that's, that, that's common for me. I know that. You know that. I know that world. So that's, that's what it is. It's the, it's the human condition. That we're depraved. And God is trying to break us out of that condition. Yeah. And, and it's, it's not easy. If anybody told you it was easy, it's not easy doing what God called you to do that's different. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's right. Mm -hmm. It's possible in Christ. Yes, it is. And then you've got to fight to stay. I'm, I'm, you know what? I, I, I know the world is tugging at me at every corner. Yeah. 
but I'm going to stay here in Christ. I know this, they've, they've got a shortcut to get rich, but I've never seen, after 40 years of funerals, I've never seen a U-Haul behind a hearse. But I do know over in glory, streets are paved with gold. I'm keeping my eyes on that and not on this. And so, you know, that's, I mean, so powerful, both of y'all, that was, that was good, is that one thing about lawlessness, we shared this with the men on, on Monday, Monday night at the huddle, is lawlessness never produces holiness. Lawliness, lawlessness always produces more lawlessness. When you study your Bible, there are going to be times that you have to really wrestle with that text because it's going to be saying things that you don't like. Your flesh is not going to like it. You know what I'm saying? And I, I don't think that the Jews were coming in there just bulldozing them. You know, the enemy fixes things up to make it appealing to us. Oh, you know what Paul said? You don't have to do it like that. If you do it like this, you're going to be good. You know what I'm saying? They don't have to go through all of this. But we have to be willing what we first got, like he was telling the Galatians, hold on to that. Mm -hmm. Don't go back. Even if you don't know where to go next, hold on to what was given you. Don't let anybody come and whisper in your ears and tell you they doing too much and that's too hard and you can do it another way because that's what gets you in trouble. Mm -hmm. You know, because I've heard people say things like, you know, we're talking about like fornication. And I've heard people say things like, well, I'm engaged like how Mary and Joseph were espoused. You know, technically they were married. You know, people twist scripture around like that. You know, I had a lady tell me her pastor told her, as long as you pay your tithes, and she was shacking up, as long as you pay your tithe, you good with God. So that's why you have to know the word of God for yourself. And hold on to it even when it's stuck in your throat. Hold on to the word of God. And, you know, as we close out, I know because we're a couple minutes over, is uh, that's one of the reasons why God laid on our hearts to do Bible study like this. It's whatever is preached on Sunday. We have to give you an outline. We have to give you the opportunity to go do the word studies and to dig in it. And then Wednesday... You come back, and after you've done your research, make sure we're all on the same page. After tonight, I rest my case. You own all of this. The, op the responsibility is not on me. Now, whether you filled out your homework sheet or not, you have been given the opportunity to make sure what was preached was the word of God. Amen? Amen? Amen. All right, Brother Ron, are you close us out tonight? Father God, we come to you uh, right now to just thank you for your word tonight. Uh, thank you for a better understanding, Lord God. Um, just pray that this word that we receive, that it really truly changes us into your son's character and not our character that we are carrying around, Lord God. Uh, Lord God, we pray that everyone that's um, here tonight, that they have a great rest of the week, Lord God. Uh, we pray for traveling mercy and grace for each and every one of us. Uh, also pour back into Pastor, First Lady, and Sister Tortisha what they poured out tonight. Uh, give them a double portion of anointing. In your son Jesus' name we pray and ask, amen.